Hey guys, you are listening to the Secular Buddhism Podcast. This is episode number 18. I am your host, Noah Roshetta, and today I'm talking about the pursuit of happiness. Maybe more specifically, liberation from the pursuit of happiness. If you're a first-time listener, welcome to the podcast. If you're a repeat listener, welcome back. The Secular Buddhism Podcast is a weekly podcast that focuses on Buddhist philosophical concepts and teachings presented for the secular-minded audience. In every episode, I like to remind my listeners of a quote by the Dalai Lama, where he says, Do not try to use what you learn from Buddhism to be a Buddhist. Use it to be a better whatever you already are. If you enjoy this podcast, please feel free to share it with others, write a review, or give it a rating in iTunes. And now let's jump into this week's topic. Why do we chase after happiness? I think the short answer is that it feels good to be happy, and it doesn't feel good when we're not happy. It doesn't feel good to be angry or sad, uh, for too long at least. And it does feel good to be happy, to experience joy. So we end up in this position where we decide, I want more of that good stuff, happiness, and I want less of that bad stuff, sadness or anger. And then we get caught up in the pursuit of happiness. We're continually chasing after the things that make us happy and continuously avoiding the things that will not uh, make us happy. So that's the topic I want to discuss today. This has been on my mind uh, for about a week now, last Sunday I was on my way down in the morning to a meditation session about an hour away from where I live. And on my way there, I had punched in the address in my GPS on my phone. And I left with enough time to make sure I could be there early because I don't like being late. Um, So on my way down, I'm keeping track of the time and I'm thinking, this is great. I'm I'm gonna be there right on time. And as I pulled up, to the location. I knew this couldn't possibly be the location because I was in a residential area and pulling up to a house. And I knew that the group that I was going to visit met at a yoga studio. So I thought, well, this can't be the right place. And sure enough, after checking, uh, it looked like uh, Google had messed up. So I was kind of sad, and but not, not too concerned because like I said, I left early. So I thought, well, maybe I should punch in the address Uh, Instead of Google Maps, I'll try Apple Maps, which I rarely use because usually Apple Maps leads me astray. Um, So I punched in the same address to Apple Maps, and it said I was 10 minutes away from the the right location. So I sped off to the new location following Apple Maps directions now. And as I pulled up to the new location uh, 10 minutes later, I thought, oh, this still doesn't seem right because it was a big empty field. And at that point, I didn't even question it because I have been wrong many times with Apple Maps. So I thought, well, somehow this address just isn't pulling up on on, on either system. So I Googled the name of the studio that I knew they were meeting at. It was a yoga studio. And I punched in the name instead of the address into Google. And that worked. It pulled up the name. And on the map, it showed that I was 10 minutes away. So I sped off at this point, realizing now I'm going to be 10 minutes late because by then it was starting time, but the map said I was 10 minutes away. So I raced off and I'm starting to feel frustrated because I I really don't like showing up late to place, especially, you know, imagine a big meditation room and thinking if it's, if they've already started and it's all quiet, then I come walking in late, it interrupts everything. So I really didn't, didn't want to have to do that. But I had already driven an hour to get there, so I wasn't just going to give up and go home. So I, I, I start following the new directions on Google Maps. And as I'm pulling into the new parking lot 10 minutes later, I realized this can't possibly be the location because I had been there before. That was an old, uh, their old address. And I knew that about a month or so ago, they had switched to a new address. So I thought, well, why did it take me to the old address? Maybe they didn't update the right address on their website. So I get on my phone and I start doing a little bit more research and find out there are actually two locations for the studio, for the specific yoga studio. And 
after checking on Google Maps again, I realized, oh, it did pull up too. I just happened to pick the first one, which was the wrong one. The second one is the right location, and the address on that listing matched the one that I was uh, initially searching for. So I punched that one in on my GPS, and it says I'm 10 minutes away. And at this point, I'm kind of frustrated because now I'm going to be 20 minutes late by the time I show up. And that's assuming it takes me to the right place. So I start heading back to this new location, following my GPS. Uh, and at the, I had 10 minutes to burn while I'm driving. So while I'm doing this, I decided to try to practice uh, mindfulness, thinking, okay, I can tell that I'm upset. I'm frustrated that I'm going to be late. Let me work with that. I've got 10 minutes to go. Um, I'm just going to think about that. What is it that makes me upset about that? And it was fun, almost comical, to realize the irony of the situation. I had I'd started out my day thinking, I want peace and calm, so I'm going to drive down to meditate so that I can start out with a nice, peaceful, calm day. And that ended up being the very source of my frustration, is that I couldn't get to where I was trying to get to get my peace. <laughs> And, and and I found it comical thinking if I didn't want peace this morning, I could have just stayed home and I'd be content and happy at home because I didn't want peace. But instead, I wanted peace. So here I am frustrated that I can't have it because I can't get there on time and I can't even find the place. And just the irony of the situation uh, had me laughing. So I finally pull up to the what should be the right location. At this point now, I'm 20 minutes late and I, I look at the parking lot and think, okay, this looks like the right place. And I look across the street, and what do I see? The the abandoned field, the empty field that Apple took me to the second time I was trying to look for the address. So at that point, I just start laughing out loud, thinking, ah, oh, the irony of this whole thing is just too much. Here I was at the right place at the right time, but I didn't see it because I was on the wrong side of the road, and I just assumed I must be at the wrong place, so I continued my my wild chase to the right place that only brought me back to where I was initially. And at this point, it's just all comical to me. You know, if I was late to some meeting, maybe I wouldn't have uh, made too much of it, but the fact, again, the fact that I was going to meditate to start my day out with some peace and calm is what made this just almost too funny. So I showed up, and yep, I walked in late, and it was fine. I didn't think much of it, and I'm glad I I went even though I was late because it was a wonderful experience, and it accomplished exactly what I was hoping to. It was a very uplifting uh, day after that. And the funny thing is for for days since this happened, because this is last Sunday, all week I've just been thinking of the irony of the situation And how in in life, we do the same thing. It's the thing that we want that becomes the very reason that we suffer. We want something, and we can't have it, so we suffer. And then if you're lucky and you find a a spiritual path, so to speak, and like Buddhism, for example, that says, okay, the problem is in wanting. Okay, then I want to not want. And now the fact that I want to not want and I can't not want makes me frustrated because... Now I want the thing that I can't have, which is to not want, but I want to not want. So it's the irony of the whole situation is comical. And that's the nature of reality. It's the fact that we chase after happiness that guarantees that we're never going to be happy because we have a misunderstanding of what happiness actually is. We treat happiness like it's this thing, a permanent thing. And if I can find it, then I'm, I'm done. I'm solid for the rest of my life. I'll just be happy. And, I, and, and and it entails not just being happy, but avoiding suffering. I'm not going to be sad. I'm not going to be angry anymore. I'm just going to be this peaceful, zen-like person who's only blissed out. And the harder you chase after that, the more suffering you'll experience because that's not a scenario that's real. That's not real life. So this reminds me of a story I want to share with you. And this, this is told in several circles uh, among Sufi poets. Um, and the main one, Attar of, of Nishapur, and I think I've shared this before, he talks about a fable in which a powerful king assembles all his wise men to create a ring that will make him happy when he's sad. And so he's, he's going through this period of life where he's sad. He doesn't want to be sad. Nobody does, right? He wants to be happy. So he tells his wise men, 
come up with something that's going to make me happy. And again, this is a metaphor, right? So after deliberation, the wise men get together and they come up with a ring and they hand them the ring and the ring has the inscription, this too will pass. And it has the desired effect. He realizes, ah, the sadness I'm experiencing is impermanent. This is wonderful. And, and the understanding that it's impermanent is enough to get him to start being happy because sadness is not a permanent thing. So now he's happy. However, he looks at the ring and realizes this message is also cursed because now whenever he's happy, he's reminded that it, happiness is impermanent and it's going to pass. And that's where this expression, this too shall pass, comes from this story. And this is a, a story that I think has a profound teaching in it. And it's the understanding that emotions, like all things in life, are impermanent. So to chase after happiness, to pursue happiness, is, uh, it's like pursuing your shadow. You know, you can chase it your whole life, but it's something that isn't, it isn't a permanent thing. It's not a, a thing that you can catch. It's not a thing that you can grasp. Happiness is very similar. You know, when we look at other emotions, sadness, anger, um, fear, these are, they're emotions that arise, they linger, and then they disappear. They, they're in a constant state of changing because that's the nature of emotions, we happen to fixate on happiness because it's one that we like. We like how we feel when we're happy. And we realize that we don't typically like how we feel when we're sad or when we're mad. So we, so we latch on to the concept of happiness and chase it like we would our shadow. And, and then there we are. We spend our whole lives chasing after something that is never meant to be had as a permanent thing. It's, it's never meant to be something that you can actually get. And then, boom, there you go. Now you're happy. You'll never experience the other emotions they're, because they're uh, fleeting emotions. They're impermanent. So if we can understand the nature of happiness as something impermanent, then we have a new sense of freedom. So one way to think about this is... Um, is like we would think about the shadow. When the conditions are right, a shadow appears. And when the conditions are not right, when the conditions are not met, met and there's no uh, source of light, uh, an object to cast a shadow, then there is no shadow. So when the conditions are right, happiness is there. We experience happiness under the right conditions. And when those conditions are not there, we don't experience happiness. And when the conditions are right, we experience anger. And when the conditions are right, we experience uh, sadness. That's the nature of human emotions. So what's powerful in this is realizing, okay, the point isn't to obtain happiness and to avoid sadness or avoid anger or avoid all the other emotions. What we'll learn and what we'll see, a, a wise way of approaching this experience of life is to think, okay, all of these are natural, normal emotions. And at some point I'll feel one and at some point I'll feel another and they're all impermanent. Imagine that you have that ring with the message etched, this too, uh, this too will pass. And next time you're experiencing an emotion, whether it's a positive emotion or a negative emotion, remind yourself that this too will pass. And then we don't have to latch on to so tightly to these emotions. They're just impermanent emotions. It's the nature of being human is that we're going to experience all of the range of emotions that humans experience. And not one of these is a permanent emotion. You, you can't catch it and say, okay, that's it. From here on out, I will only experience this one. And so much of our suffering comes from the misunderstanding of the impermanence of our emotions. When we're experiencing anger, for example, you can get angry at the fact that you're angry because now you're caught up in this conceptual idea of anger's bad. I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm supposed to just be happy or grateful. And I, I speak out of experience on this. I used to genuinely believe that there was no legitimate reason to ever be ungrateful or to be angry or to be sad. And my, in my mind, it was always compared to, well, you know, think of so-and-so who has it so much worse, or think of the starving kids in Africa, or some scenario like that. And I'm not saying that, it, that, that we shouldn't compare completely, 
But what I'm saying is everyone's circumstances are unique. So it's unfair for me to say, I lost my job, but I shouldn't be mad because somewhere else someone is starving. There, there may be some truth to that from a, from a perspective sense, but from the natural way of human emotions, it, they don't work that way. You know, everyone would never experience any emotions if they could just simply compare themselves to someone, someone else. Now, it may help a little bit, but you're still going to, the, the point here is no matter what type of life you have, you're still going to experience the full range of human emotions. This is why you have uh, people in third world countries who live in poverty who can be happy, and you have someone living in a first world country who has fame and power and wealth, and they can be unhappy. They can be experiencing suffering and anguish because that's it's the natural way of being human is that it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, you're going to experience the full range of emotions no matter what. So the freedom in this, Buddhism is often referred to as the path of liberation. So if we're applying that thinking to the concepts of human emotions, what is the sense of liberation that we get? Well, it's actually a pretty incredible one. You see, when you don't have to be happy, then now you're free to be content. It's like the expression, now that I don't have to be perfect, I can be good. Well, this is similar. Now that I don't have to chase after happiness as if that's the only emotion that counts, I can just be content with whatever emotion I'm experiencing. And when I'm experiencing it, I can just be with it. For example, anger. When I'm angry, I can understand anger is natural and it's okay. I can't get rid of anger and that's okay. You can't get rid of sadness, and that's okay. You just learn to be with it while it's there with the understanding that this too shall pass. These emotions are all impermanent. And when the conditions are right, they appear. And when the conditions are not met, these emotions aren't there. And that's it. This reminds me of a teaching, a Zen teaching that I once heard that I really enjoyed. And it's about the journey. And the, uh, the idea of the story is that there's a man who's on a journey and he's trying to get from here to there. And there happens to be on the other side of the river. So as he's traveling and he comes up to the river and realizes that to leave here and to get there, I've got to get across this river. He can't find a suitable place to cross because it's dangerous. So he starts walking uh, along the edge of the river looking for the right place. And this goes on for however long, hours, looking for the right place to cross. And at one point... He reaches a, a place where he can see somebody sitting on the other side, happens to be a monk. And he sees this monk sitting on the other side of the river, and he finally yells out to him. He says, excuse me, excuse me. And the, man, the monk looks up and looks at him, and he says, can you please tell me how to get to the other side? And the monk kind of looks at him bewildered, uh, looks up and down the river, and then finally yells back, you are on the other side. And that's the story. That's the whole story. And I love this story. It makes me laugh when I hear it. Because how do I get to the other side? Well, from the perspective of the monk, he says, you are on the other side. And this is the nature of reality when it comes to perspective. Wherever you are, for you is here, for someone else is there. You know, there is no here and there other than based on perspectives, where I am is where I am. Where you are is just where you are. And with emotions, it's the same. I'm happy, I'm happy. And when I'm mad, I'm mad. And when I'm sad, I'm sad. There's no need to uh, fight off a specific emotion as if I could guarantee that there's something that will ensure I never experience that again. You can't do that. And you can see this in real life by observing people who chase who are caught up in the pursuit of happiness. You know, they're thinking it has to do with money. And when I can finally get enough money, then I'll be happy. And they chase after this their whole lives. And and some of them do reach this point where they, they finally get a lot of money. And the first thing you'll notice is that they're no different than anyone else. They just happen to have more money. Happiness-wise, they still have their own set of difficulties that arise in life because that's the nature of life, that difficulties arise. There is no guarantee against them. And I do want to be clear to specify that there is a baseline. There's a baseline where once your needs, your basic human needs are met, beyond that, there's no change. 
money, power, fame, none of it's going to guarantee more happiness. But if you're under the baseline, then yes, you know, if, if you don't have proper shelter, you don't have love, or you don't have, you know, your basic human needs aren't met, then yeah, that's the first thing. Those need to be met to have that baseline of happiness. But you'd be shocked at how low that line is. This is why, like I mentioned before, there are people in third world countries who live very happy lives while you have people in first world countries who have so much more who live very unhappy lives. Because none of these things that we typically associate with happiness are uh, guarantees of happiness. Because happiness is just an emotion. When the conditions are there, we experience it. And when they're not there, we don't. Money is no guarantee of it. Fame is no guarantee power is no guarantee. And we tend to chase after those, uh, those three specifically, because somehow we, we live in the, in a delusional society that thinks that those three things will have bearing and weight on how happy we are and, and how much we can minimize our suffering. And it's just not true. You can look at any study and you'll find that it's simply not true. So it leads us back to the initial question, why do we chase after happiness? Well, another answer would be it's just our, our, it's our human nature. It's our human nature to experience something pleasant and say, I want more of that, to experience something unpleasant and say, ooh, I don't want to experience more of that. And then we start chasing after, uh, after those two things, chasing the things that are pleasant and avoiding the things that are unpleasant. And that's natural. But the the misguided understanding of that is that either one of those are permanent. There's no guarantee of any formula that's going to say, that's it. Now you won't experience suffering. You can work hard your whole life building up money, wealth, and power. You finally get it. You think life is good. And then your loved one dies in a car accident. And now you're experiencing suffering or you get sick. And now you're thinking, I'll, I would give all the money that I have to find a cure for this, but there is no cure for it. And there you are experiencing suffering just like anyone else. Because the nature of reality is that difficulties arise, right? This is the first noble truth in, taught in Buddhism is that in life there is suffering or that in life difficulties will arise. So when we understand this, we become free. We become free from the chase of pursuing happiness. Happiness, you can think of, is part of the overall journey. So there can be happiness in the pursuit, but what is it you're pursuing? What is there to even pursue? You know, if you understand the nature of the interdependence and the nature of impermanence, especially when applied to human emotions, then you're free to just experience living. There's no point, specific point, other than the point is to live. So you get to just enjoy things for the sake of enjoying them. This is how I tend to live as uh, the lifestyle that I have. I, I like to chase after experiences for the sake of the experiences. And I, and I enjoy adventure, adventurous stuff. I, I love flying. I fly uh, with a paramotor and paragliding. I love traveling. I love taking pictures and, and capturing my experiences. And I, I, I would have to say at one point initially, I was chasing after happiness. I thought the answer to happiness was doing this and avoiding that. And over the years, that's evolved because I found that no matter what I do, I still get anxious when uh, you know the time of the month to pay bills comes around. I still get stressed when I'm thinking uh, of a specific deal that fell through at work. You know, I, I, I none of that has ever changed. But somehow, in the middle of all of it, I'm still content. I'm enjoying the experience of being alive. And that doesn't just mean the good experiences that also includes the bad ones or what we would perceive as bad. You know, after a a particularly stressful day or, or a specific stressful event that happens at work, I often find myself thinking, I'm glad I've experienced that because when someone else is going through that, now I know what that's like. I've been through that. And it makes me grateful for the experiences that caused pain, you know, tremendous pain in life to think, I know what that's like because I've been there. Allows me to have more compassion and kindness for others because I get to experience 
everything. I want to experience everything. I want to know what it's like to hurt. I want to know what it's like to be sad. I want to know what it's like to be blissful and happy. And fortunately, I've experienced a broad range of these emotions. And even more fortunately for me now, I understand that they are all impermanent. I, I, I feel what is expressed in the parable that this too shall pass, this too will pass, has been a fantastic way of looking at life and understanding my personal pursuit of happiness. It's no longer something I pursue, at least not, not in the sense that I pursue it thinking I can actually catch it. Now it's, it's something I can have fun with. See, when you understand that it's impermanent and that it, it's just the nature of life is to experience all of it, you can have more fun with it. And when, when I'm experiencing happiness, I love thinking, oh, right now the conditions are there. I'm experiencing happiness. This is great. All the while knowing this is impermanent. Enjoy it because it's impermanent. And then the same thing happens when I'm sad or when I'm angry. I'm just with it. I'm not trying to change it because I know it's impermanent. When the conditions go away, the emotion also goes away. And that's the beauty of, of just living life in a way where you're detached from the pursuit. I'm just enjoying it as I go because I don't need to latch on to, to the delusion that it's actually something that I can have. There's actually happiness is something I can obtain. I can pursue it. I can catch it, put it in a cage and it's mine. That's a delusion. I would be better off chasing my shadow for the rest of my life. So that's the topic I wanted to share in this podcast. Why do we chase after happiness? The concept of the pursuit of happiness. I, I want to hopefully give a sense of liberation. Now, not, now you're free to no longer pursue happiness because happiness is just something that it will be there. When it's there, it's there. When it's not, it's not. And try to think of happiness like you would any other emotion. You know, we don't particularly chase after anger or, or chase after sadness. And, and yet, no matter what you do, you're going to experience those as well. So freedom from the pursuit of happiness. And now that you don't have to be happy, you can be content. Now that you don't have to chase after happiness, you can just enjoy life with a content attitude, even, even when you're experiencing positive emotions or negative emotions. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I look forward to another topic next week, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week. So take care, and until next time. Thank <music> you.